ministry among us. Good morning! <laughs> so good to see you. Doing well today? Yeah, you look marvelous. You look marvelous. Absolutely marvelous. Good to see you. At this time, we're going to release the kids. So kids, you are free to go down to Children's Church. You are going to have a fun time down there. So you just go here, go back there, head that direction, head downstairs. And it is going to be great. And welcome to you who are joining us online. Happy Easter to you all, friends and family who are joining us from lots of different places. Well, as they're going, I have a special announcement. Uh, if you've been here for a while, you know that we've been looking for an associate pastor, and we found one. Yeah, so I'm excited to announce. Here they are. So this is Michael Allen, Michael and his wife Naomi. I've known them for about 10 years. They've been ministering here in a church not too far away from here. And he comes qualified. He comes excited. We went through all of the gamut of all of the meetings, introducing him to various teams and lots and lots of prayer. So we believe that this is God's provision for us and connection with them here. And you'll be excited to meet with them. So they're going to be coming. Their first Sunday is going to be July 3rd. So a little while. They need to successfully unplug their ministry where they are to replug in here with us. That Sunday, we'll have an installation service for Michael. You get to hear more about him. And, and in the Crosspoint Connection on Thursday, we'll have more of a bio and, you know, some more information there. But that is going to be a fabulous Sunday on July 3rd with a picnic afterwards. And the uh, Lord's going to bring us together. So it's a great, great day. So I am excited. You should be excited as well. This couple is a gift to us. Okay. Today, my hope is that you and I and we all will be encouraged, that your hope would grow, and that from instruction of God's Word, that we would gain strength to continue to serve Christ and live in Him. I don't know about you, but it seems like there is a lot of people suffering these days. Have you noticed, right? Look at the news, and it seems like, you know, here's a shooting up here, there's a shooting down there, and here's a car accident here. And, of course, we look at the global scene, and there are wars and takeovers and suffering and movement all over the place. I have a number of friends who are counselors and psychologists, and they are busy, busy, busy. Because people are suffering because of isolation or inflation or lots of different things, stagnation. These things are affecting each one of us. And it has been a hard time in our world. Personally, I don't like suffering, okay? And if you enjoy it, there's something wrong with you to a degree, right? I don't like it when my body doesn't function as I want it to. I don't like it when I pick something up heavy and something cracks somewhere that it shouldn't, right? I don't like being separated from family. I don't like wanting to buy something and not being able to. And there are people in here that this past year has been super difficult. From reoccurrences of cancer to realizing that you have cancer to losing a spouse or a child or still struggling physically or emotionally or relationally or spiritually. The good news is that Christ enters our suffering. When you think about Christ when he first appeared on the planet, it wasn't like joy to the world, even though that was sung. Why? Because Christ came, and the time in Israel was difficult. There was an occupation, so to speak. There was a war, the Romans were there, and Christ came in to a brutal government that killed little babies as a threat. That's the time he came in, when the world was in chaos, where it was disconnected, where there was mass movement, when there was uncertainty, when there was instability. That was the very time in which God and his sovereignty brought the light of the world into our reality. Christ understands suffering 
and sorrow and difficulty and heartache. This morning, we're going to receive help from Christ himself. What he offers us as the greatest comfort and equips us with another gift of grace to minister to each other. So Jesus, again, it was injected into humanity as a salve for our suffering, as a hope in the darkness, as the Savior of the world. And as you know, he grew up and experienced life just like we. And when he was around 30 or so, began his ministry years after he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came upon him and the voice of his father said, This is my son who I love. Listen to him. He was tempted by Satan himself after a prolonged fast when he was at his weakest. That's when temptation comes. And by the way, that's when temptation also comes our way. Jesus, passing that test, ministered and started to proclaim the good news. The kingdom of God has come. And he called people to follow him. And he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom in that area. And people started to listen. People started to wonder. People started to question. Who is this man? And some, of course, were drawn to him and gave their very selves to him and dropped everything that they were holding on to or doing to embrace who this man man was. And miracles, oh, did they see miracles from someone who was born not being able to see to suddenly seeing, to someone who was unable to speak, to to speak, to people who have been suffering for years and years and years, finally, blissfully, glorifyingly receive new life. From feeding of masses of people to walking on water to raising the dead. There was no one like this man and they were trying to figure out who he was and he talked to his closest companions, his disciples and told them and taught and told them and taught and told them why he came to save his people from their sins. Three years of this ministry, three years of people gathering to catch a glimpse of him and climb trees to see him. Three years until he finally entered into the great city of Jerusalem at the height of a feast where they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Right before he entered into that town, he had made friends with so many, but of course there were others who were enemies. He had a report of a dear friend of his named Lazarus who had become sick. And we are going to look at this passage this morning. If you have a Bible, go ahead, open it up. John chapter 11, starting with verse 1. So I want us to understand the setting. And the first primary point is that there is a reality of suffering in the world. This is our common experience. This is something that is a part of what has taken place after the fall. And so we want to realize this and embrace it and see it for what it is. So here we are, reality of suffering, John chapter 11, starting with verse 1. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. These are three siblings living there together. Verse 2. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. They had a long-term relationship. 
So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Let's pause right there. So Jesus was away from this spot a couple miles outside of Jerusalem. And they sent a messenger to go tell Jesus that the one you love is sick. So what this tells us is... That even if you are dearly loved by Christ himself, that doesn't exclude you from suffering. Some in our day and some of our age will say, well, if God loves you, therefore you will not have to suffer. That does not bear itself out in Scripture. And you can say amen right there, right? Don't ever tell somebody that it's the lack of faith is why they're suffering. That is sick, right? It's wrong, and I would call it even spiritual abuse. Right? Don't ever tell someone that, nor receive that. Say, well, you're suffering because you did something wrong, or God doesn't love you. Did God love Lazarus? The answer to that is yes. Dearly, deeply, completely, wholly loved him, and yet he was sick. And then Jesus had this interesting response in verse 4. This sickness will not end in death. He knows the end from the beginning. And he says, no, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. This gives us a little light in God's thinking about our suffering. God allows it to happen in the confines of our fallen world. Sickness and suffering is a reality. And God said, Christ said, that this sickness, this suffering is for God's glory. Now, when I am sick, and I have been sick, when I am suffering, and you suffer at times in various ways, my first response is, when can I get done with this, right? Where's the doctor? Get me some medicine. I don't like this, and when is it going to be over? That's my thought, right? And I can be a whiner, right? Maybe you're not. I can be. Don't ask my wife about this, by the way. We'll just keep this between us. Okay. Don't like it. <laughs> That's my normal response, and I imagine this might be your response as well. Can we just get beyond this? <laughs> I've trained myself to ask the wrong question. <laughs> And I'm asking us to ask a better question. In the midst of difficulty, disaster, despair, despondency, depression, disconnection. We all have been in those places. This is the question I'm asking you from this text to ask. How can God be glorified in this? That question, that mindset will help you. And you have to train yourself to ask that question because we don't naturally ask that question at all. God, how can you glorify yourself in this? And it may mean that there is a healing. Do instantaneous healings happen today? Yes, they happen today. It may mean that it will be a progression of healing. It may mean that it's going to take longer than you want, expect, or ever thought was possible. And there's people in each of these categories. 
But this is the question I want you to ask. God, how can I, how can you get glory from this situation? God, help me to glorify you today in the midst of suffering. Can you imagine if you ask that question, and I'm challenging you to ask that question. Difficult question, hard question question, but the right response for us who believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And sometimes you just have to pray, God, I don't know how this, how you will glorify yourself in this, but I ask that you will and help me to see that. This response from Christ to this messenger was significant. And pay attention, it continues on in verse Five of John chapter 11. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Again, this establishment of their connection. For when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. The timing of Jesus is not always our timing. And his delays are not our denials. Catch that. Okay. Intentionally stayed. And by the way, Jesus didn't even need to go where he was. Why do we know that? Because we read in the Gospels that Jesus just spoke the word and someone was healed. We see this time and time again. Jesus not only delayed in his presence being there, but he delayed in just speaking a word. Now that seems a little cruel, doesn't it? Jesus, what are you doing? He's suffering. This is your friend. But he understood God's plan, what God was planning. And so if you are suffering, we ask the question, God, how can you be glorified? And say, God, will you help me to see your better plan in this? Would you agree that God's plans are typically better than your plans? (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to say typically always better. So if there's a delay, we say, God, we trust in you. So there was this delay that was deliberately chosen by Christ. Sometimes, and perhaps you are now experiencing the delay. The disciples heard this in verse 8. And they said, wait a second, you want to go back to Judea? But Rabbi, they said. Now, a short while ago, will you remember when you were like, we were there? And the Jews there tried to stone you? with rocks the old-fashioned way, right? Stone you. They tried to kill you. They tried to hurt you. And yet you are going back? Jesus, don't you understand that this is a dangerous situation? Verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they will see by this world's light It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no lights. He was saying, hey, listen, I know what's going on. I know where it's going. Just because it's dangerous does not mean we're going to move forward. Some people believe that the safest place for you is in the center of God's will. That's not true. The best place place for you is the center of God's will. Sometimes God calls you into difficult situations. So think, well, it's safe. It must be God. (laughs) Really? Tell that to the disciples. So I want you to recognize That God has an agenda that is taking place in his timing. Sometimes you trip and fall, right? The question should not be, is it safe? 
or if I go there, will I be free of suffering? The question should be, God, is this where your light is directing me to make the biggest difference? Are you hearing me? Do I applaud missionaries to go into places when others are fleeing? This is why we applaud those who run into buildings that are tumbling or places that there is fire or firing. Jesus wasn't afraid of difficulty or suffering or danger, nor should we. So in the sense of preservation and self-protection, the disciples are saying, Jesus, are you sure about that? Have you ever told God what he should or should not do? (laughs) God help us, right? He says, no, we're going. This is God's will, my Father's will for us. Verse 11. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, guys, our friend Lazarus, It's fallen asleep. (laughs) But I'm going there to wake him up. Now the disciples replied, like us, well, Jesus, if he sleeps, he'll get better. (laughs) Now Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. This, by the way, gives me hope, right? (laughs) Sometimes I don't get it either. And so Jesus then (laughs) told them, Plainly, guys, um, <clears throat> Lazarus is dead. Okay, <laughs> and for your sake, well, that's interesting. For your sake, I am glad I was not there. Why? So that you may believe. The primary target. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, our good friend Thomas, who has now been named Doubting Thomas, Mr. Optimism, (laughs) the twin, he said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him, right? We're obviously all going to die. It's going to be horrible. Thank you, Eeyore, right? Let's just go die and get this over with, right? Maybe you have that mentality, right? God still loves you, by the way. Not only loves you, but invites you in. Taste and see. So there is a reality of suffering. Don't be surprised when it happens. This is established. We have to understand this. We know viscerally. We know personally. We know corporately. We know these things happen. And all as consequences of the fall. And here comes Christ into the reality of suffering. So now, now let's look at how we are, comf- the, what comfort we receive. And the first thing that he provides for us is the comfort of resurrection. Now, this is interesting. Okay? So here we go. This guy is sick. He's now dead. They're dearly loved. They're now traveling to this danger zone. And let's read what happens. Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found... That Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany, which was a little town, was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and to Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was on his way, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed home. Verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Now, you may have the personality of Martha. That when she heard in her weeping that Jesus was on his way, she didn't wait for him to show up. She had some questions. And so she got up. So I ain't waiting. I've been waiting to ask him some questions. And went to him. And asked questions that we ask in particular in tragedy. Jesus, if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. Have you ever asked that question? Jesus, where were you? When the car read a red light and smashed in and killed my son. Jesus, if you were here, my child would be suffering in this way. Jesus, if you were here, why did you allow my spouse to die or this cancer to come? These are legitimate questions of our soul. God, where are you? And Martha had these same questions that we often had. Jesus, where are you, God? Where are you? What's going on? And if you would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. And Jesus was not surprised, nor was he alarmed, nor did he shame her for those questions. Do you notice this? He didn't say any of that. He didn't say, how dare you? How selfish of you? He didn't say any of that. He knows. And his response is astounding. The comfort and the theology, and she needed some explanation, came with five little words. Your brother will rise again. The greatest comfort God gives to us is the promise of the resurrection. That's the comfort to someone who is asking theological questions. He was saying, listen, this end isn't the very end. It's just an interlude. And guess what? The second half is going to be way better than the first. He will rise again. There will be a resurrection and I, my father and myself will make all Things new. Don't lose sight of what is yet to come. In our suffering, it is just for a time. But in comparison to what is yet to come, it is what a moment. Well, I've been suffering for 10 years. Tell me how that looks 100,000 years from now. 200,000 years. You don't understand it hurts. No, it does hurt. It is horrible. It makes us long for the resurrection where everything is put new. And so I want you to remind yourself of the theology of the resurrection that says that the greatest comfort in our suffering is knowing that God will make all things new. Do you believe this? This is a Christian hope. This is what helps us in strength to take another step forward. Because it will not always be this way. And so these theological questions to God's apparent silence and stillness, he speaks to us, You will rise again. It will be made new. This will change. So Martha, hearing this in verse 24 of John 11, says this. Martha answered, I know he will rise 
again in the resurrection at the last day. He says, well, I know this theological concept. And then Jesus turns it and says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never eternally die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Just like Jesus, to take an instance of loss and sorrow and suffering. In the midst of these questions, where were you? He points to the resurrection and then becomes personal. I know that you know this as a theological concept, but the question is not, is that a reality? But do you believe? You get this, right? The most important question any person has to answer is, who is this one, Jesus Christ? Do you believe? Every salve in this world, every help in this world is temporary. The primary question is not, when will I get out of this? But do you believe in the one who is the resurrection and the life? I love this term. Asking this good friend, do you believe? And it's a question I'm asking you. God is asking you, if I can be so bold today. Do you believe? Believe personally. Not this showing up on Easter, but you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life who has come into the world. This is the right and good question. Whoever lives by believing in me. Underline that. Whoever lives by believing in me. It's one thing to say, well, I believe in Christ. And we as Americans, 86% of us, according to surveys, say that we believe in Christ. Belief in Christ and living in Christ are two different things. If he is who he says he is, then he is worth listening to, following, giving yourself up for, because he first gave himself up for us. Do you believe? So our first comfort is in and from the resurrection. This will not be permanent, regardless of how long you have been suffering. Amen, Pastor. Well, amen. Come on. Second, we see a, another comfort given. And this is one God gives to our, us, and this is one that we can help other people with. And we can port people t- towards the resurrection and also the next one, the comfort of presence. Verse 28 of John chapter 11, the story continues. Now after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. Mary, the teacher's here, she said, and he's asking you. (laughs) Now when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, 
noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. Let's pause. I really, really like what took place here. Martha had an interaction with Christ. She got what she needed to the question, Jesus, where are you? He answered her in theological terms, in intellectual terms, saying, this is what is true. Do you believe? Martha then, now knowing that Christ was close, went and told the sister, hey, he's calling for you. And don't you like that Jesus calls to us in our suffering? He first calls us to himself. And we have opportunity to meet him. Jesus makes himself available to us in often intimate ways when we are suffering the worst. That's interesting to know. If you think that Jesus has forgotten you and you're suffering, you're wrong. This is when he calls to us. He's asking for you. He's offering his presence to you. God is not far from anyone. We may be far from him, but he isn't far from you. And he offers us his presence, his very spirit to help us in our times of need. And so we pray, God, I want to feel your presence. Know that you're calling to me and his Holy Spirit comes to us. Notice also in this passage that Mary was comforted by the presence of other people. You know, sometimes the best thing that you can do when someone is suffering is go to them and say nothing. Your presence matters. I've had to do a lot of funerals in this last couple of years. I've had loved ones close to me die. And when people take the time to stop what they're doing just to show up and be present, it matters. It's comforting. It's powerful. Those little phone calls, those cards, those showing up matters. Jesus showed up. He didn't have to be there to announce and pronounce healing, but he showed up personally. Other people were there personally, and this can help you as well. If you're one that will push people away when you're suffering, will you open the door to your home and your heart and say, hey, I'm suffering, and allow people to minister God's grace? Now, one of the best things that you can do for others as well is just to show up. To listen, to pray, to do what you can. The God offers us in our suffering the comfort of his presence. And I want you to ask God, where are you? And say, God, help me to understand what you're doing. This will help. And then on a horizontal level, connect with people who are suffering. Just show up, be present. Next, this is the next comfort after the resurrection, after um, uh, being present. Thirdly, there's a comfort given of tears. Let's continue to read verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was, now the next sister is here, and when she saw him, notice the difference here. She fell at his feet. It wasn't like Martha who had some things he needed to talk about and had some things she needed to talk about. Mary came and fell at his feet. She asked the exact same question of her sister, but a different posture. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Now when Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. 
He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Now comes one of the, well, the shortest and one of the most profound verses in the Bible. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, cannot he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Do you notice how Jesus responds to Mary? Martha needed something different than Mary needed. Martha needed the logical and theological answer. She had questions. Mary had a different demeanor, both broken but in different ways. And she fell at his feet and said, Hey, Jesus, have you been here? And Jesus didn't offer her a theological argument or the promise of the resurrection. You know what he did? He just cried. He just cried. He just cried. Jesus is not indifferent to your suffering. Thank you. It's not. There is a connection on an emotional level and some of the best things that we can do with others when they're weeping, grab a Kleenex and just cry. It's healing, it's helpful, it's healthy, it's holy. Doctors have found that there's different compositions in tears. Sometimes we cry in laughter, and that's one thing. And sometimes we cry in sor sorrow. That's another thing. The tears are different than what comes from, physically speaking, even from tearing. Different chemicals come to the surface that help in our healing. God put that in the process of your body, by the way, as a help. Jesus wept. And so one of the things that you can receive when you're suffering, is the power of tears. Don't be afraid to express it, to let it go, to weep. And this is a significant work. This, this isn't just a trickle down your eyes. This is weeping. I think I've seen weeping to this degree just a few times. One of the times is when I did a funeral here in town of a family I marginally knew that their 19-year-old son was killed in Chicago. It was gang-related. And I was sitting on the platform, okay, up, you know, up here sitting. The coffin was here. And there was a line of people, and we started the funeral an hour late. <clears throat> and so here I am. You know, there's only one seat up here. Right? This is sometimes the seat of the pastor at a funeral. And I'm looking as people were coming right down the aisle to me. And it was an open co coffin. And I'm telling you, there was weeping like I never knew. I didn't know that young man, but I was crying deeply because of what I saw with person after wailing, weeping, hugging for literally an hour and a half. The best thing that you can do at times like that is just cry with somebody. Really, seriously. A lot of you are nodding your heads. <laughs> Just cry, it's a gift. God himself wept. Let that blow your mind. The creator of the world came into our suffering and wept with us. If I was God, I would say, yeah, I'll come when y'all get better. <laughs> I'll come on a celebration. No, no, no. God comforts us in Weeping in suffering, in difficulty, and it is a gift, so there's a comfort of tears. So cry and do that with one another. It helps, and know that God is not indifferent to your suffering. 
Next comfort. There's a lot I know. The comfort of belief. Verse 38. Jesus once more deeply moved. Deeply moved. Came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Probably similar to the one that he was going to be in in about a week or so. He said, take away the stone. But Lord, said Martha, the pragmatic one, by this time there's a bad odor. Decomposing is set in. For he'd been there four days. Now you can start seeing the timing of God. This wasn't a swoon, someone who was unconscious, someone who was barely breathing but alive. There needed to be time so that there was certainty that this man was gone. Setting up the situation, waiting for the right time. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. The most valuable commodity in suffering is hope. Hope that it will change. Hope that you'll be relieved. Hope that it will be reconnected or repaired or resurrected. If in suffering you do not have hope, it is unbearable. So there is comfort and belief. And so the question is, do you believe that it will get better? People with belief have strength to continue on, right? You know the passage of Hebrews chapter 12, that the joy set before him gave him strength to do what? Endure the cross. Thank you. Endure the cross. What gave him strength? Hope. Joy that's set before him. If you have a hard time finding hope, ask God for his joy. David had to tell himself this at times, right? Have you ever talked to yourself before? Thank you for answering. I'm not the only crazy one. Have yourself a little pep talk, right? Scripture tells us actually to do this. You know who did this? David did. It's like, yo, listen up, right? Stop being, oh, downcast on my soul. Put your hope in God. Sometimes you need to be your own best cheerleader. You get up in the morning, (laughs) instead of saying, oh my God, (laughs) say, oh my God. (laughs) Put your hope in God. (laughs) Do you still believe? I know it is difficult. Belief persists through persecution and pain is of greater worth than any substance known. Anything. Believing through matters. And Jesus says, do you believe? Do you believe? You believe, and he prays. He says, I'm not, praying. I'm not praying for my benefit. Jesus knew what was going to happen. I'm praying that people know that God, the Father, is going to do something miraculous. The last thing is this. There's the comfort of help. Help. Verse 43. The scene is set. There's weeping. There's these sisters, these these interactions, it's rolled away, and now what? 
And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And some speculate that if Jesus didn't say specifically Lazarus, he would have emptied out the whole cemetery. <laughs> Lazarus, come out. Can you imagine being Lazarus? All of a sudden, there's new life. <laughs> Amazing. The dead man, he was dead, came out. His hands and his feet were wrapped, strips of linen, cloth was around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. <laughs> There's real help from God, and God did what only God can do. And we need to ask God, God, I want to see your glory in this. Will you do what only you can do? Men, hearts heal wounds, put pieces back together. God loves restoration, and he loves resurrection. He specializes in putting things back together. We have creation, and then we have recreation, and he loves them both. And so he asks for real help. God, will you do what you can do? And then, isn't it interesting, right at the end, it says, he tells others, now take off his grave clothes. Help the man. And sometimes we receive comfort as well with just practical help, right? From delivering a meal to speaking a word to holding a hand to repairing a car or whatever it is, right? Practical help. There is comfort in these things. So we ask God to do what only God can do. And we listen to say, how can we help you in this suffering. These practical things matter and they bring comfort to the suffering. Salve for the suffering. Now this event was a remarkable miracle. It was a powerful event in the timing of Jesus and his ministry. The place was specific, the timing was specific. And because there were so many Jews there, right? This is right before he entered into what we celebrate in Palm Sunday. This happened right before this. There were so many Jews there from Jerusalem. This family was so well known and respected. And when Lazarus came up, they couldn't deny that this was a miracle. Right? No trickery or whatever. And Jesus never tricked anybody any way, for any reason. His miracles were legitimate. This happened. They knew that he was dead. They saw that he was alive. And it says that many people put their faith in Christ. So much so that the, the leaders of the Jews, who eventually, um, the following week, convinced the people to crucify him, they said, you know what? Not only do we, we need to kill Jesus, but we need to kill Lazarus as well. Because of his testimony, people are believing. So this is what I want us to walk away with today. First and foremost and fundamental and foundational is this. Do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God who came into the world? Do you believe that he is the resurrection and the life? And this Easter could be your resurrection and your belief and your changing from darkness to light, from lost to found, 
death to life. Do you believe? And you have some semblance of belief unless your grandmother dragged you here today, which she might have. And bless your grandmother. I want you to think about this. Jesus, the one, and this resurrection, or this uh, wasn't a resurrection, because by the way, Lazarus died again. Do you know that? He was revived. But what happened on Easter Sunday, he never died again, right? The true resurrection. But saying that he could overcome death itself, pointing to the true reality of resurrection when he, by the power of the Spirit, came alive. Jesus not only can mend broken bones, he can bring life to what is dead. And if Jesus, all he did was do miracles and couldn't do anything about death, we're all got massive problems. But because he conquered sin and death, we have great reason to rejoice. So number one, put your faith in him and then live in your faith in him. Number two, if you're suffering today, and some of you are suffering, we all perhaps are suffering in various ways, receive the truth of the resurrection. It's going to be over someday. Retreat, receive the comfort of the presence of God and the presence of other people, and we can offer that to others. Receive the hope in belief and knowing that there is always hope in God and with God, receive the comfort of tears and of presence and of practical and spiritual help. So now you're equipped to help others in this world, and we, and we're going to close in song and prayer, have opportunity for a new life. And by the way, if that's you today, I want to hear from you. Come and pray with these people who are here today. And all of us are going to leave in the hope of the resurrection and also equip to bring comfort, to salve to our suffering world. Do that. Make a difference. And I can't imagine if all of us said, you know what, I'm going to hang on to this. And all of us said, you know what, God, thank you for this Easter lunch that you're going to be celebrating. Look for ways in which you can bring comfort to others through the presence of Christ. In your life and his words, do this, and we can start to continue to push back the tide of suffering that wants to overcome the world. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Make a difference, so let's pray. So God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for your glories and your goodness to us. God, thank you for all these wonderful people who are here today. God, thank you for the hope that we have in you, Christ, that we celebrate the resurrection this day with great joy in our hearts, and rightly so. God, I thank you that your presence is here. And Lord, I ask that if there's people here that are away from you, that they would call in the name of the Lord and be saved to put and engage in trust with you. God, for those of us who have walked with you, and those in particular who are suffering today. God, I ask that there would be comfort, <laughs> that you help us to ask good questions, that we look how to glorify you, that we would hang on to belief, that we receive comfort in various ways from you and others. And God, I ask, Lord, that you would glorify yourself in our suffering. Thank you for the glorious resurrection, and we look forward to that, God. Because you live, we can face tomorrow. We praise and glorify it in our hearts and in our homes and in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.